1964, I read a small piece in a New York newspaper, just a tiny little item about a man who had caught a 4,550-pound great white shark off the beaches of Long Island. And I thought to myself at the time, what would happen if one of those things came and wouldn't go away? It was the adventure of our lives, and we knew it. When I think of Jaws, I think about courage and stupidity. And I think of both of those things existing underwater. This became something that was bigger than just a movie. This became a phenomenon. And I said, you know, if we're successful at this, people will feel about the ocean the way they felt about the shower after Psycho. Almost everyone remembers when they first saw Jaws. Even the newer generations have seen it on television. I saw Jaws. I remember the theater I was in. I remember what I did when I went home. I wouldn't even draw the bathwater. This was the first novel, and it was a story about a fish. And I had no real title for it. I tried a hundred different things. Some of them were quite pretentious, uh, Francois Sagon kind of titles, like A Stillness in the Water and Leviathan Rising and all of that stuff. And then we ran through all sorts of cliché titles, The Jaws of Death, The Jaws of This, The Jaws of That, which all sounded terrible. And uh, finally, with 20 minutes to go before the book had to go into production, I sat with my editor in a restaurant in New York and... I said, we don't agree on anything except one word, Jaws. Call it Jaws. And he said, what does it mean? I said, I have the faintest idea, but at least it's short. Peter Benchley's novel came to my attention and my partner Richard Zanuck's attention at approximately the same time on opposite coasts of North America. The agency gave four or five producers uh, some, an early peak. In my case, it was a card from the offices of Cosmopolitan Magazine, which my wife edited, and gave a brief praise of the novel, and the last sentence was, might make a movie. That's why we read it overnight. Next day, we spoke to one another and said, let's do whatever we can. They bid for it, finally Universal got it for a staggering, then staggering sum of $150,000, and I think at the time they were expecting to make it into a a good B-movie, sort of a, a nice thriller picture, but they had no great ambition for it. We didn't even dare to think at that time how we were going to do it, but we, we just wanted it. It was a good story. I met with them constantly. I interviewed directors with them. We all worked together right from the beginning. I wrote three drafts of the screenplay. One of the first things Richard Zanuck said to me was, I want to get rid of that love story, the whole sex nonsense fact. Get rid of it. This is to be an A to Z adventure story, period. As a condition to the purchase of the book, we had to agree to a certain director. And we had a meeting with the director and Benchley, and uh, in which uh, the, the director kept referring to the whale during the lunch. Steven Spielberg had directed the Sugar Land Express for Mr. Zanuck and for me, and we were very keen about him. But the subject of Spielberg's interest in Jaws came after the man who thought the shark was a whale. The manuscript disappeared from the top of my desk one day when he'd been floating around the office. I just remember seeing a very large, you know, you know, uh, a block of pages that said Jaws on it, and I didn't know what that meant. Jaws is what's it, Jaws? Is it like a about a dentist? Then I got word a few days later that. You know, this would be something that Stephen might be interested in doing. We huddled with Steven Spielberg at the Bel Air Hotel in Los Angeles and committed to finishing the movie on June 30th. There was a strike looming, and the, the plan was to start shooting the picture as soon as possible and finish it, finish shooting and come back to the studio before the strike. The script was a transcript of the novel by Peter Benchley, which is what we asked for. Then another pass by Howard Sack, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. Howard Sackler's draft was a fairly conventional thriller kind of film without uh, much humor to it. And the characters were kind of uh, one-dimensional. I asked Carl Gottlieb, who was a friend of mine, to come in to, to do a polish and to actually help 
me, you know, if I wanted to improvise scenes, Carl would be there to help organize the improvisation and put it on paper. In the morning after that, I was on a plane to Martha's Vineyard with Stephen to start rewriting the movie 10 days before the start of principal photography. At that time, I was a location casting director. So I had not uh, that much to do with those three main characters. I do think they're probably the most brilliantly cast threesome that I've ever seen on film. I had originally suggested putting in it uh, Paul Newman, Robert Redford, and John Voight. And David Brown and Richard Zanuck pointed out to me quite kindly that the star of this movie was a fish. The three actors, Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss, were all of different minds and different temperaments. The Scheider had to be, uh, forgive the cliche, a fish out of water. We know all about you, Chief. You don't go in the water at all, do you? Some bad habits. Everybody knew him from uh, the French Connection, where he was a tough, gritty New York cop. We couldn't find anyone for Clint. And I wanted to go to Lee Marvin, but Lee Marvin wasn't interested. We'd used Robert Shaw in the sting, but he was not a superstar. He was a well-known personality, character actor, really. It's just women with bow-legged women. Joel Gray wanted very much to play the Richard Dreyfuss role. I loved Merton Gaffey, and I had seen him in that, and George Lucas was the person who sort of said to me, why don't you cast Ricky? So Stephen tells me the story, and it was thrilling and exciting. And he said, you want to you do this movie? And I said, no. And he said, why not? I said, because I'd rather watch this movie than shoot it. And then I went to see a film that I had done, The Apprenticeship of Judy Kravitz. And I so hated my performance in this movie that I called Stephen long distance and begged for the part. He showed up, he walked in the door, and he was Hooper. He was wearing a knit hat, he was wearing little glasses, and he had the beard. Who are you? Matt Hooper. I'm from the uh, Oceanographic Institute. Stephen and I looked at each other and said, that's him. Don't change or don't change a thing. My husband has him during shark. The first person I, I cast for the movie, in fact, was Lorraine, who I had loved in a TV movie I'd seen her do called The Marcus Nelson Murders. There was some cynical comment that Stephen had bought an insurance policy by casting the studio head's wife in the film. Uh, and it's true that she's married to Sid Scheinberg, who was running the company. Well, I, I've got to presume that Sid's job had something to do with the fact that I was considered for this movie. Uh, I don't like considering it, but that seems real. He and, and Stephen were friends at that point, and Sid was sort of his mentor. She brought a realism to the movie, a real realism to that family, which I wanted in the film. Michael! Did you hear your father out of the water now? What was different about this movie was what Steven Spielberg referred to as the special defects department. Defects for effects. And a shark, that simply would not cooperate. Steven and I, sort of in a naive way, said, you know, we're not going to do any matches. We're, not going, to, we're going to do this thing full size out in the real ocean. There were preliminary sketches based on, on the book, and they were just sort of large, rough, uh, charcoal sketches that I made to show the various sort of activity that the shark had to perform. 